I'm Bert, and, and I actually consider myself a person first. I will never refer to myself as a cancer patient. I never refer to myself as the type of cancer I have. I'm always Bert who happens to have cancer. That's the way I refer to myself because I never want the disease to define me. Um, so I am a native New Yorker and then ultimately ended up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm married, we have um, we have two kids. I love living in Oregon. It's such a beautiful place and I love the outdoors. So I walk outside a lot, I hike a lot. One of the things that's changed for me once my, I got my diagnosis, I, be, I became a lot more um, driven to make a difference in the world. So I'm worried about dying because I don't plan on dying and I'm gonna live for a really long time and die with the cancer, as we say, not from the cancer. Um, but it's, it's helped me crystallize what's important to me and some of the things that are important to me are doing new things. So I, I've had, uh, I also have chronic Lyme disease and I was in treatment for chronic Lyme for a long time. And um, I have had a rough couple of years work-wise, like I was laid off twice in three years and both jobs were ridiculously stressful jobs. Like one, I think I had 71,000 miles flown by June 1st in a year. So it was, and um, so that was extremely stressful and really took a toll on my body and my mind. My health just started to decline. Like I wasn't feeling myself anymore. And then as time went on, I started to develop more brain fog. And I went, to, I flew to a conference in Boston and I got to the conference in Boston and I couldn't, um, basically couldn't think. Like I couldn't write a text. I couldn't write an email. I couldn't order food to a hotel room. I would lose my phone, which is something I've never done before. Um, like I just, I wasn't myself. I was completely out of it. The brain fog was terrifying. Um, and brain fog is a Lyme disease. So I actually thought it was Lyme, but I was supposed to start seeing a new Lyme doctor. And I remember being in my hotel room in Boston and I hadn't even had my first appointment with her yet. And I called her and I was crying and just saying like, help me. Like, this is the scariest thing I've ever gone through. Like when you can't think and you can't control your thoughts, like it's terrifying when you're aware that you can't, it's terrifying. It was sad, but it, like sad doesn't even really enter your consciousness when it's like, holy shit, what's going on in my head? And I talked to my wife and I talked to my sister and they both said, get on the next flight back home. Like, don't stay anymore. Just come home. And uh, I came home and I'm a, I believe in holistic medicine. So I've been seeing a naturopath for 14 years since I've lived in Oregon. And we went to him and he helped me bring me out of the brain fog. So he helped clear my brain. Um, and then uh, at the end of, or in June, I started to regress. And then finally, right around July 1st, my wife looked at me and said, we're not going through this anymore. We're going to go to a hospital and make sure there's nothing seriously wrong with you. So we went to the hospital uh, because of the brain fog. While I, uh, there was some, like they sent me home and then I went back and um, it turned out I had bad internal bleeding from two ulcers, one in my small intestine. And as soon as you have internal bleeding, it's like, you know, everybody move. We're getting, we're throwing this one on a, in a room on a table and everything. So uh, had a bunch of tests done. They found I had cancer when they were doing this CAT scans for the internal bleeding. Um, we kind of said, okay, we're putting cancer on hold because internal bleeding is like, I could die today. <laughs> cancer is like, I like there's time. So we focus on the internal bleeding um, and about eight, nine days in, finally got that under control through some interventional radiology stuff. Uh, and then as I started to heal, then we turned our attention and started to deal with oncology. But the first three or four days in the hospital, I was like mostly non-coherent uh, because of the brain fog, which turned out to be an ammonia buildup in my brain, which was because I was having um, liver function issues. So they cleared that up and put me on meds that actually helped a ton. Uh, so the first few days I was in and out of coherence, but after I had that upper um, endoscopy where they flooded my cavity with blood and the, the doctors came into the, the room the next day and I was coherent enough when they came in and they came, the GI doctor came in and he was talking to my wife and 
at one point he looked at my wife and kind of whispered to her and said, he knows he has cancer, right? And I didn't. And that's how I found out. And, and like, it's important to note, despite the fact that I said, I'll deal with the cancer later, as soon as I heard that I had cancer, which I learned while in the hospital, like I would wake up at three in the morning thinking, oh shit, am I going to die? If I die, where do I want to die? Who do I want around? Right. Like I was having, and I'm not going to die. Like, I can't be more clear. I will not die from this. Like, like barring anything I don't know that's about to take away everything I'm capable of doing. Like it's not even in my consideration set, but I would wake up in the hospital at three in the morning and start crying and thinking like, you know, I actually have an image in my head of like where I wanted to be when I was going to die. And it was pretty wild. But anyway, so, so it's not completely clean, right? It wasn't like only bleeding, only cancer. There's obviously intermingling, but once the bleeding got under control and I was stable, then we started to deal with cancer. So we had, first of all, there's no ideal way to hear. Um, second of all, I refer to cancer as the, the, most successful unintentional marketing ever like you say you have cancer everybody thinks you're going to die like it is amazing right like there's so many things associated with the word cancer that may or may not be true and i have two types one which is kidney cancer which they can remove by surgery and then the other type i'll have for the rest of my life but uh there are people who i talk to all the time who've lived 20 years with it or even more and don't die from it but die from other stuff um so the cancer doesn't terrify me. Uh, actually, actually, not at all. That being said, I feel amazing. I probably feel more myself than I have in years. I actually, um, I give myself what I call a Burtness scale, <laughs> which is like how much I feel like Bert, where a 10 is like, I feel exactly like myself and nothing's wrong whatsoever. And like, I'm pretty high on my Burtness scale lately. I really feel like, I really feel great. I mean, I have, I have two cancers. But I feel great. And like, it doesn't stop me from doing anything. I drive, I'm self-sufficient. The biggest struggle for me was people that when I told them I had cancer, who would say, I'm so sorry. It's like, don't be sorry. I'm fine. I'm not sorry for myself. Uh, like, if you want to feel sorry for me, that's up to you. Just don't do it in front of me because I don't need it. Because that's honestly what we've all been conditioned to think. Right? Like, it's not like, it's not like oh, you have cancer. That's a chronic illness, like ulcerative colitis right? Like people don't think like that. People think, oh, you have cancer, death. Um, usually now when I talk to people and I tell people I have cancer who, who don't know already, I say to them, like, they'll say to me, how are you? And I'll say, I'll tell you, but you can't tell me you feel sorry for me. Like, and I'll say, like, my goal is to remove that conversation from them. So they don't have to feel the whole time. Like, what do I say? So I was talking to a friend and she said, how are you? And I gave her that speech and she said, that's fine. I won't tell you, I'm sorry for you. And I went through it. We had a great conversation about it. And she comes from the health insurance industry. And she said to me, you know, I know health insurance can be a bear with stuff like this. If you want me to go through all your insurance stuff and see how I can help like negotiate with the insurance company, become a patient advocate, whatever you want, like that would be amazing. Like, I'd be happy to do it. And it was like, to me, like that was amazing, right? Because because she understood what I was going through and she was empathetic enough to say, let me help you with what you're going through. Not, I'm going to generically pray for you or, hey, do you want me to get a meal train? I don't even know if you eat anything or not. Or, you know, not, I'm so sorry. I'm going to pity you even though you don't pity yourself. Like, it wasn't that. It was like, she understood my situation and knew what people in my situation needed. And she responded based on that. Like, I consider myself Bert who happens to have cancer the same way I happen to have eczema or happen to have, you know, my legs itch, right? Like cancer is a higher degree of difficulty, no doubt, but that's what I am. I'm not a cancer patient. Like the disease will never define me. Um, so I think the the death thing is hard, but there's a lot of people who have cancer who don't die. A lot of people who have cancer who don't die. And there's a lot of people who live a really long time with cancer, even if they ultimately end up losing to it. So like the people who are actually thoughtful enough to think about who you are and what you might like or what might help you and respond, like that's worth its weight in gold. Like it's the generic stuff or now what I refer to as emotional macros, which are like someone says this, use this response. Um, like those are, it's fine, but it's like not, you know, every if somebody says, I feel, I'm so sorry for you. It's like, thanks. Like if you, if you say to me, I'm so sorry for you. Tell me more about what you have. Are you worried about it? Can you sleep at night? How's the impact on your family? Like that's a whole different thing. That's great too. 
when I was in the hospital, um, so I was in the hospital for two weeks. So it was really about stopping the bleeding and getting me stable. Like the whole, the whole hospital experience was about stability. I did have biopsies taken of my kidney and my liver while I was in the hospital, but um, it was like a side procedure, basically. Like everything was about stopping the bleeding because again, I could die from the bleeding immediately. Um, so after uh, I was at a hospital, part of the Providence Health System. So they set up a, an appointment for me with um, one of their oncologists. Uh, and then I'm also good friends with somebody who runs a research lab at OHSU, which is Oregon Health Sciences University, which is a major hospital in Portland. Uh, so we reached out to the two of them first, and I already had the appointment of Providence, and they both said OHSU is great. And my friend who works there set me up with the head of the pancreatic cancer um, unit. Uh, and I don't have pancreatic cancer, but I have an offshoot. So he met with me and then he, uh, we really liked their approach. And I like the fact that it's a teaching hospital. I like the fact that they're uh, internationally recognized. They actually ended up getting a really, really good oncologist who specializes in the, my cancer is called a peanut. That's one. I have peanut and renal clear cell carcinoma, which is kidney cancer in English. Um, the So Providence just hired a great net doctor. Uh, but, uh, I was already at OHSU and turns out my medical oncologist at OHSU and the Providence net doctor are friends. And so they got me on a protocol called cap 10, which is, it's a, uh, it's two meds. It's one is called capacetabine and one is called temozolomide. You also take one called Zofran for nausea when you take the temozolomide. Um, so it's this, it's the same protocol that I'm on now. So I've basically been on the protocol since the end of July or early August, and it's 28 day cycles. So I'm about to start cycle eight on Thursday. Uh, 28 day cycles. You have two weeks, or you have 10 days on. I'm sorry, you have 14 days on capacetabine. Um, the last five of those days, you add the temozolomide. So you're on two drugs for the last five days, and take the anti-nausea when you take the temozolomide, and then you go two weeks off of any chemo drugs. So that's the only protocol, like oncology protocol I'm on. In addition to that, like, you know, I, like I said, I'm holistic, right? So I'm trying to go to yoga twice a week. I eat really, really well. Um, I'm trying to exercise more, although it's been tough lately, but I'm trying to be more active as much as I can. Uh, I found that my mental health is the key to my physical health. So if my mind is engaged and if I'm feeling useful and valuable and using creativity, I feel like I feel better overall. So the peanut's the priority because it's already metastasized. So I have it in my liver too, and some lymph nodes and some other places. The kidney cancer, um, everybody's basically said that's your second priority. So we're not going to worry about that yet. Um, the only way to deal with kidney cancer really is through surgery. Um, my chemo protocol is systemic. So it makes sense that it would shrink the tumors and shrinking the tumors in my kidney too. But either uh, the surgery, which I said is the part that scares me. Again, not ha can having cancer doesn't scare me. Having surgery, it's ca it's called a distal pancreatectomy. So I have a six currently, although I'm getting another scan at the end of March. But currently, I have a six and a half centimeter tumor on the tail of my pancreas. So they'll remove that part of my pancreas. They'll remove my spleen and my gallbladder. And then, since I have metastases in my liver, I have a lot of um, or I think four or five tumors in the left lobe of my liver. Uh, so they'll remove the left lobe of my liver. I do have some tumors on the right side, but they think they can just take those out. And my uh, apparent, the liver is the most amazing organ ever. Uh, supposedly the right lobe of my liver has already grown a ton to accommodate for some of the function that I've lost with the left lobe because my liver function shows and my kidney functions both show fairly normal in all my blood tests. So the surgery I'm going to have to have is a huge surgery and that scares the hell out of me. Um, hopefully they can do this kidney part as part of that surgery. If they can't, then I'll have to probably have a separate, a separate, um, whatever it's called procedure for the kidney. Uh, my surgeon has told me it's, he said, it's a serious surgery. He said, you could be on the table for nine and a half hours. He said, I'm going to be in constant conversation with the anesthesiologist about, do we think you can take more? Or are you losing too much blood? Uh, you know, do we need to close you up and have you come back in four months? Or like, can we get most of it out that they, they know they won't get a hundred percent of the cancer out again, the kidney is different. They can get a hundred percent of the kidney. I think, uh, the peanut they'll, um, he, my surgeon has read studies where if you get 70% of it out, it's as effective as getting 90% out. So, uh, he feels like he can get out the primary tumor, which is the one in my pancreas and a bunch of the other stuff.
And he's also said to me, the liver is the most important thing for you. He said, the liver decides if you live or die, basically. So he said, like, our focus will be the liver. And then if we can do everything we have to do in the liver, then we'll remove the primary from your pancreas and then we'll do the other stuff. So I'm very, very, very lucky. And I'm very grateful. And I'm, I, I don't even know who I'm grateful and thankful to. Well, I know who I'm grateful for, but I, I don't know who I'm thankful to. But uh, like, I have an amazing support system. My wife is unbelievable. My medical team is great. My two naturopaths are both amazing. Yeah, I'd say um, one of the things is you're always going to be your own advocate. So um, our, there's no way to say this, but our healthcare system sucks. Uh, like there's some decent people who work in it and there's some good people who work in it, but the system itself is horrible. Uh, so if you don't advocate for yourself, a lot of times no one's going to advocate for you. So I, I went through that upper endoscopy, like I talked about before, that was really bad. That almost, it didn't know, I don't know, it almost killed me, but I almost died while having it. Um, and then a couple of days later, they wanted to do another upper endoscopy on me to see if the bleeding had stopped and if the ulcers were getting better. And I said, no. And they said, why not? And I said, my body can't take it. I said, like, I, I don't want my I don't want the procedures to cause my body more harm than whatever's going on in my body. So um, I actually had, there were hospitalists, a general generalists who came in and said, we want to do another procedure. And I said, no, I said, my body can't take it. I said, I'm too weak. Uh, you know, I almost bled out from the last one. I said, I don't want it. Uh, and they said, okay, they said, it's your call. And the next day the gastroenterologist came in and we told him the story and he said, yeah, I would never give you another one now. <laughs> He said, I wouldn't do it either. So um, at the end of the day, right? Like you're in control. Uh, I don't want to put myself through that right now. You, so you're you're always in control of yourself and yet you have to be in control of yourself, right? You're the one who this is supposed to help or you're the one that this is going to hurt. So if you're worried about something, like don't just do something because a doctor says to. All, all the best doctors are used to having the discussions. I go into... I have an oncologist appointment today. Today's the first time I'm probably not going to do this, but almost every time I've gone into my oncologist, I've said, hey, what about this procedure that I read about online? And I put the onus on him to explain to me why it won't work. That, that's the one other piece of advice I would give, right? So um, like I, I set up time with my doctor, uh, it must've been three or four months in. And I said to him, can we have an appointment where we don't talk about my test results at all? I said, I just like, you're going to, we're going to be working together. We're going to be partnering on this for a, a long time. Can we just talk? And we did. And it was amazing. And that's the other thing I would really recommend is like the day of doctor is God is gone. Like if you treat your doctor that way, it's only going to hurt you. Um, they all expect it. Like in the cancer world, everybody expects that you're going to get a second opinion. A lot of them will recommend you do and even give you people to go talk to. Uh, so being your own advocate and understanding that at the end of the day, you're in control of every decision. The last thought I'll just leave you is I think there's really two parts to cancer and there's the, the treatment part and the experience part. The experience part is where people don't ever focus on or talk about. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about doing the story stuff is because like experiencing cancer, like, so I go to a lot of groups that are all about treatment of cancer, right? I get this monthly shot, uh, put this cream on your butt, it numbs it and it makes the shot better, right? Like great tip, nice to know. Um, the groups I haven't found yet, which I'm trying to find are, I was just diagnosed last week with cancer. What do I do? Like, who do I talk to? How do I explain to my mom I have cancer? Um, how do I explain to my brother I haven't talked to in 50 years that I have cancer, right? Like, like those groups don't exist. Um, and the experience stuff needs a lot more focus than it gets. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the day, put yourself first. It doesn't matter what type of cancer you've been diagnosed with, right? Like, you have those thoughts and talking to other people who have those thoughts would be really valuable. Like. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of work in the cancer world to be done around understanding the experience and culture of actually having it.